There are many ways of describing my guest today. He's one of India's best-known industrialists. He's the famous grandson of a yet more famous grandfather. He's the scion of one of the oldest Parsi families in Bombay. And he's a plucky street fighter who gives as good as he gets. But do any of those descriptions actually capture the personality of the man himself? Judge for yourself as I introduce you to Nasli Wadia. I can't resist the temptation. Are any of those the correct description? Maybe all of them. All of them? <laughs> okay, let's start with your beguiling family background. I gather you come from your father's side, from a family of master shipbuilders, and those ships are actually quite famous. Yes, there are a couple of ships that are partic particularly famous. One was the Cornwallis, and the other was the Minden. Uh, one of the ships, I don't remember which, um, the American National Anthem was written on. Way back in 1810? In 1810. And the other, I think, in 1840 or 42, something like that. Uh, the Treaty of Nanking was signed on. And, and then many of the ships were flagships of the British Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. So is this a little bit of family history that you're particularly proud of? Well, it's, a, it's an important piece of history, and it's an important piece of family history. So and I am proud of it, yeah. And in fact, I gather the name Wadia, the family name today, refers back to this profession. Yes, uh, they, say, uh, they say that Wadia and Gujarati mean shipbuilder, you know. So the label is one that you keep forever? Well, that's my name. But it's from your mother's side that your ancestry is truly special, isn't it? Well, in what way? Well, her father was a particularly famous man, wasn't he? Well, he was a famous man, yes. But Aren't you going to tell us who he is? I think you know that, no? Muhammad Ali Jinnah, but I yeah. want you to say it. Well, yes, he was my grandfather. He died when you were four. Yes. Do you remember? Very, very va vaguely. I remember I mean, being taken to him, but... Uh, on one occasion, I think, um, I pulled his cap off his head, and he gave it to me, and I still have it. And so if you call that a memory, that's, that's about the memory I have. Was it difficult in post-partition India to grow up as Jinnah's grandson? Not really. No. In fact, not at all. You were never teased at school? Or no, nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing. Are you proud of your grandfather? Extremely. Very proud of him. Do you think he's a misunderstood man in India? Well, it depends on the context in which you look at him. I mean, uh, really, I don't want to get into a political debate because, you know, there are views and views on the subject as to what caused partition and how it came about. But uh, Jinnah is not then, if you view Jinnah as a man, and as, a, as, a, as a person, he was a man who achieved a great deal in his life, apart from politics. Um, he was one of the top lawyers in the UK. He came from... Uh, you know, he went to England as a young man, uh, virtually penniless, educated himself, rose to the top of his profession, came back to Bombay, rose to the top of his profession there, um, lived very, very well, uh, you know, dressed well, lived well, he liked good food, uh, he was a very erudite person. Um, and then he got into politics, because he was also a, a great nationalist and had a great uh, spirit about the freedom of India. And he joined the Congress Party at that time. So, there are many aspects to him. There's okay. one other aspect which you haven't touched on, which is that he's one of the few people in those early days who deliberately married outside his faith and religion, and who in many ways lived openly, even if it meant defying his religion. He drank, he ate pork. Yeah, I don't think he married outside his religion deliberately. He fell in love with, with, with a young girl and married her. It wasn't a sort of deliberate, conscious move to marry outside his religion. But he did, uh, He did. yes, he married outside his religion. He what about eating Parsi. pork and drinking? Because he did that quite openly, sometimes well, I mean, defiantly. He, he got into the habit of eating bacon and eggs when he lived in England. So he ate bacon and eggs. And, and drinking, yes, he drank. He used to have a scotch in the evenings. He was an erudite man. He, he was never worried. He wasn't a hypocrite. He wasn't a hypocrite. Yeah. Would you, as his grandson, see it as part of your mission to balance the image a little better in India? No, I don't think that's my role, quite frankly. Um, why should I balance the image? Uh, you know, at, only at the end of the day, history will decide what was right, what was wrong. Um, and the history is still very young. And so there are, you know, views which are, in a sense, uh, are their recent memory, I put it, you know, which influence the view on Jinnah. But with time, when maybe a hundred years from now, uh, history may see him differently to, to the way they see him today. And of course, there are two views on him. There's the view on this side of the border and there's the view on the other side of the border, you see. Neither of them are necessarily right. 
Okay, your parents sent you to school in England when you were really very young, I think eight or nine. Eight, yeah. What was it like? Not very pleasant. You hated school? I didn't like school, no. I was told it was going to be the happiest days of my life. It certainly wasn't. <laughs> but it was a particularly chosen school, rugby. Yeah, it was a very tough school. And you know, English public schools in those days were very tough. And I went, I went to a prep school in England just after the war. And I remember, you know, in those days, the, the war was over. There was a shortage of food in England. And we used to eat horse meat, you know. So it wasn't exactly very present, you know, coming from Bombay all the way to England. And the journey was a long one. Communication wasn't what it is today. So one was some, somewhat far away from home. Were you a spoilt young boy who'd gone to school and hated the discipline of it? No, I don't think so. I don't think my parents really spoiled me, you know. In fact, they were quite tough on me. When you came back and you joined the family firm in the early 60s, they actually made you work your way up from the very bottom, isn't that so? Yeah, I started, as, I started in working in one of the textile mills. And uh, I worked there as an apprentice. Got yourself suspended once, didn't you, when you got into trouble? Yeah. I was, what yeah. happened? I don't know. I didn't turn up for work. I was fooling around or whatever it was. And um, I, you know, they took disciplinary action against me like they did against everybody else. So you may have been the chairman's son, but there were no special concessions for you whatsoever. Well, people won't believe that, but that's, that's substantially true. In the 70s, your father thought briefly once of selling Bombay Dying, and you had to fight him to retain the company. No, I didn't fight him. My father had a view that, you know, at that time, taxation was at a very high level. Um, the tax, I think, in India was something like 97.5% on the income and 8% wealth tax. And he thought it was better to migrate and live abroad. Um, he was not willing to sort of, uh, you know, go down the wrong route, in a sense. And so he said the best thing is to migrate and go and live in a country which is more, you know, um, so we say conducive. And I didn't agree with him. And I was able to talk him out of it. Odd, because although up till then you'd lived most of your life abroad in school, nonetheless, when he chose to go abroad, you consciously chose to identify yourself with this yeah, country. Yeah, I, I never wanted to live anywhere else but in India. I mean, I had no, you know, I had, in fact, I was, I, I felt only at home here. And the other thing was I didn't want to be a second-class citizen somewhere else. You know, I, okay, you would have had some money, but what else, you know? During this that, is my country. During that period when you were, in a sense, trying to persuade your father not to sell the company, someone who supported you very effectively was J.R.D. Tata. Well, J.R.D. Tata understood why I didn't want to do it. And J.R.D. and my friend, father were good friends. Um, and J., I think, helped in sort of influencing my mind. Um, not on the issue of the sale, but just generally. Virtually was one of the great influences on my life. Were you very close to him? Yes, I was very close to him in the sense that uh, very emotionally and, and, you know, personally close to him, yes. Not in the business sense, necessarily. People say that he looked upon you as the son he never had. Well, we were very close and I think he gave me a great deal of affection and I learned more from him than I think I've learned from anybody in my life. Um, and quite frankly, I just adored the man, so, you know, it was... For a long time, yeah. Sunday lunches were always had with him, weren't they? It wasn't Sunday lunch. We used, to, we used to have coffee on Sundays or beer on Sundays. You used to say, either come for beer or coffee. And we sit and chit-chat, and we do that almost at least three, two to three times a week, a month. You know. The funny thing is that there was someone else that you were very close to as well, and he was almost the opposite in every way of J.R.T. Tata, Ramnath Goenka. Yeah, he was an absolute diametric opposite to, uh, to, to J. Absolute diametric opposite. But he was another extraordinary person. You know, great nationalist, wonderful man. A man who stood by great by his principles and what he believed in. Very, very strongly proud of being an Indian. As was Jay, you know. Jay Tata was a very, very strong nationalist. I mean, I've seen Jay Tata literally with tears in his eyes saying, you know, I wish we can change the economy of this country. I wish we can develop and get away from the socialism. And Jay used to fight with the government in those days. People the line that they were taking. People can easily understand how you were close to Jay Tata because in so many ways you look and sound the same. But what brought you close to Ramnath Goenka? Well, I first met Ramnath Ji... Uh, just at about time of the emergency. And um, I became very friendly with him during the emergency. And in those days, it wasn't too, uh, I don't think it wasn't too conducive to be seen with him. So I used to go and have lunch with him quite often. And um, he was a very courageous man. He's a man I greatly admired. And then we became close friends. There was a point in time when he was going through a bad patch in the 80s when he actually trusted you almost with the shares of his company. Is that right? No, I wasn't trusted well. Ramnachi um, was by that time quite old and he was trying to decide what to do with the Indian Express uh, in terms of its future. And he just left 
the shares with me physically. I mean, just like he would leave them in a bank or something. You know, it was not. Uh, they don't but he left the forms blank so that you could fill in whatever name you thought right. And he no, 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 not what I thought right. He he gave me he he told me what his wishes were at that time, and uh, he left them there with me in case something happened to him. In case something happened to him. So he trusted you enough to believe that you would do what he wanted, even if he wasn't there to enforce it. Well, I presume so. Yes. I mean, otherwise he wouldn't have done it. And the amazing thing is there is a yet another close friend in your life, again a very different person to you, Nanaji Deshmukh, who is in fact an RSS leader. Now how did you get close to him? Because again, you're polar opposites. And Nanaji and I met in 1966 and we became uh, very good friends. I was what, at that time, uh, 22 years old, 23 years old. Yes, well. And uh, Nanaji was another person who was a man of enormous integrity. Uh, enormous sincerity, one of the wisest people I've ever known. And uh, we just became close. You know what he says of you? He says that one of the cleverest strategic brains I've come across is Nasli Wajas. He says he used to sometimes consult you for the Jansang as it was in those days, and you advised him and often showed him the way. No, no, I think that's a, a slight, uh, my advising, I think, is a slight exaggeration. I was a young man, I was a young boy then. But uh, certainly had a lot of interaction with him. And I believed in greatly what he stood for. You've had three people who've been close to you. Have they been, in a sense, surrogate fathers in addition to your real father? Well, you know, in a sense, what do you mean by a surrogate father? I mean, they've been strong influences on my life, yes. Very, very strong influences. Maybe I should put it like this. You have the great ability to make elderly people look upon you as a son. Well, I, mean, I don't know. Well, Jay didn't have a son. Ramnath Ji, well, you know, lost his son unfortunately, when he was, you know, very young. And I just became close to these people. I mean, you know, I had, I had things which I felt uh, you know, I had in common with them. And I learned a great deal from them. The funny you know? thing is they're very different to each other, and most of them are very different to you as well. No, Nanaji, Nanaji and uh, Ramnath Goenka were very, very close friends. So both of them very different to JRD? Yeah, and Nanaji and JRD became very good friends. Are you the link between the two? Well, I introduced them. In fact, at one point of time, Jay said to me, well, they're RSS people, you know. And of course, the minute he met Nanaji, they became friends. Because Nanaji is that sort of a personality. So one you know? of the things you've done is to bring together disparate people because you've been their common link and friend. Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, the, the linkage between these people were really was, was me in that sense, yes. I mean, I was a friend of Ramnaji, I was a friend of, of Jay. Jay and Ramnaji became friends to me, in a sense. Okay, let's take a break. I want to come back in part two and talk about something else that the world knows about you as I described it at the beginning, the street fighter, to see whether that's really true or whether people have overdone the image. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is Nasli Wadia. Your friends and your admirers, as much as your critics and your opponents, say that Nasli is a street fighter, that he's his best with his back to the wall. Do you accept that? No, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration. What about the fact a that... A street fighter has all sorts of connotations, which I don't think are true of me. They say that there's no friend like Nasli, and then they add, and there's probably no enemy like him either. No, I think that's an exaggeration. Yes, I'm a good friend, and I, I have few friends, and I believe that you know, friends are the most valuable thing in life. Are you very picky and choosy about who you make your friend? There's no question of my being picky and choosy because friendship is really something where people come together. They have a meeting of minds, they have, you know, they have, they have things which have a common interest. And so friendship is that. It's not, it's not just about you picking somebody. Friends pick each other in a sense, don't they? Okay, I'll come to your friends in a moment's time, but the press seems to talk a lot about people they dub in quotes as your enemies. I mean, you had a run-in for a while with Rajiv Gandhi in the 80s. What lay behind that? I didn't have a run-in with Rajiv Gandhi. I'll tell you, really, basically, uh, the Indian Express, which I was very close to in Ramnachi, um, had a run-in with uh, Rajiv Gandhi, politically, in a sense. And uh, because of my close association, um, I think uh, some of it dropped off on me. So, in a sense, it was your friends that they found fault with rather than you, but you carried the character. Well, I don't know if they found fault. I mean, the Indian Express, you know, it was a... It was a personified the character of Ramnath Goenka, and Ramnath Goenka was a strong political person. And um, he didn't agree with what, at that particular point of time, the government was doing or the way it was behaving. And so I think he addressed that. 
and, and they the government picked on you. And the government retaliated. Uh, well, they didn't pick on me alone. They, of course, attacked Indian Express. But it was a tough time for you because at one point in time you faced something like, is it 2,500 interrogatories? At well, another point in time yeah, you were threatened well, with deportation? Well, there were a whole series of things, yes. I mean, you know, uh, there, was, there was a Thakkar Natarjan Commission, which was, you know, two Supreme Court judges which investigated me on, on an issue called Fairfax. And then there after that, there was a CBI case, which was a, frankly a trumped-up case, about, you know, registration in, in a hotel, in the Oberoi Hotel here. And then there was another case, I think there were some Ferra cases, which they, again, were trumped up, and then income tax cases, and, and company law cases, and finally deportation, all of which, fortunately for me, I succeeded in. But while you were going through all this, were you ever worried? Did you ever say to yourself, Christ, I seem to be in it? Well, when you're in it, you're in it. I mean, that's it. What can you do? You have to face it. So they're right when they say, when he's got his back against the wall, the best comes out. Well, it's not the question of the best. I mean, you have no choice. You know, either you curl up and, and sort of die, or you get on and, you know, face it. You have to get on and face it. That's the only choice you have. You don't choose it. It's chosen for you. What do you do? When you're in that position, do you enjoy the fighting time? No, it not bring really. Up? Because it, it, it takes a great strain on you. It takes a toll on your family. It takes a toll on you. It's, you know... And then it diverts your attention from, from everything else that you like to do. You know, it becomes all-consuming. In the early 1990s, 70 Congress MPs, I think it was, filed a memorandum to the Home Minister accusing you of being a spy, an ISI agent. They said you were going to destabilize the country. And they also said I was having an affair with a Pakistani actress. And none of it was true. And that I was involved with Dawood Ibrahim. And none of it was true. Well, I mean, do you think it's true? <laughs> you I tell mean, me. You, know, I mean, you come tell on, me. You know. It's completely, it's, it's well, why, do, why, do you think, why do you think Nasli Wadia is this red rag to the political bull? What which about political, you? It depends which political bull you look at. It seems to be the Congress bull most of the time, isn't it? Well, I mean, I think there were mostly congressmen who signed that, yes, at that time. There were mostly congressmen. Do you ever ask yourself the question, what is there about me, Nasli, that taunts them, that makes them react in this slightly exaggerated way? Well, I think there must have been somebody who helped sort of, you know, who must have instigated. It didn't have anything happen on its own through motto, so, you know. You're more sinned against than sinning? No, not really. I mean, it just, you know, I suppose uh, somebody wanted to instigate something against me, and so they got MPs to sign this, you know. Your friends say that this public persona is so different to the real Nasli Wadia. I'm told that, in truth, you're a very private man. Yeah, I'm not very social. I mean, you don't see me at cocktail parties and dinners and, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who sort of socializes a great deal. It's, it's a weakness, you know, in a sense. Hard to believe that of Maureen Wadia's husband, isn't it? No, not really, because Maureen also is very private. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't, we have a few friends. We like to spend the evenings with our friends, you know, um, and enjoy the company of people, you know, rather than sort of socialize on a, on a, on a big scale. And that's not necessarily a strength. I mean, you know, it, it, it creates an impression that you're inaccessible, which I'm not, but it, it's, and, you know, snobbish, which I'm not. It, it's just the way I am. I like to, you know, I like to go home and watch a movie, relax, you know, rather than go party. One of your great hobbies is watching movies. I believe you have your own home theatre. Well, I have a small home theatre, yes. It's one of my extravagances because I love movies. And so on the weekends, I, you know, that's what I do most of the time, I watch movies. And a couple of decades ago, some of the time, you used to watch them with a person called Atal Bihari Vajpayee. No, I think that's a gross exaggeration. I, I, through Nanaji, I met Atalji about... Uh, <clears throat> 1967, and sometimes he'd come to Bombay, and I'd invite him, like I would Nanaji, to come and have dinner. And sometimes he'd say, "Let's, you know, let's go and see a movie together." So we'd go and sometimes see a movie together. You know, I remember we went and saw a movie called Patton together. Which Several he, times. No, no, I think just uh, twice. Yeah, which he enjoyed very much. And I mean, he was not. He, he was. He was just, you know, uh, another human friend, a human being, uh, where you spent a nice evening together. Another hobby that you have is cooking. Do you do it to relax? Do you do it because you're fascinated by cooking? What draws you to it? Well, firstly, I love good food. I enjoy good food. And so I find it very interesting to cook. And so I learned to cook Thai food, and I've learned to cook European food. And when I lived abroad, I used to have a craving for Indian food and for home food. So I learned to cook Indian food and some of it Parsi food. And so I just sort of developed the habit, and I enjoy cooking. So when Nasli Wadia entertains at home, he's not just the host, he's the chef as well. Not quite. But sometimes, yes. Sometimes, you know, not for very large parties, but there are six or eight people sometimes. Quite often I cook for my friends. Okay, you have, of course, also an enormous industrial empire to run Bombay Dine. In the 22 years that you've been its chairman, what do you think you've added to it? Well, 
I mean, when, when uh, I took over Bombay Dying, Britannia was not part of our group. Uh, Bombay Burma was not part of our group. So by acquisition, uh, you know, we diversified into petrochemicals, we diversified into chemicals, uh, we acquired Bombay Burma, and now into food in Britannia. So uh, I don't think I've done as well as many people have done, but uh, I've chugged along somehow. I mean, to be honest, since you're here, many of your closest friends who are your admirers say that if Nasty had focused a little bit more on the company rather than a lot of the other things that he's driven to do, maybe he would have made Bombay Dying much bigger. But that's probably possibly a fair comment, you know. That's probably a fair comment. Do you think, looking back on it, that sometimes perhaps, not that Bombay Dying suffered, but maybe you haven't had enough time for it because you've had so much else you've been involved in? But it's not just Bombay Dying. I, I, give, I spend most of my time on my work. And I spend most of my time on, you know, um, well, I, we took over Britannia, I think, in 1994. Britannia had been flat for almost about eight years. And Britannia has now been growing in the last five years at a rate of 25% annually, both in profit and in sales. And we reinvented Britannia very recently. So when you hand over the companies to your two sons, Ness and Jay, one day, will you be able to say to them that I inherited something, I built on it, and I'm passing over the Wadia flag now for you to carry? Well, firstly, I don't know whether they want to carry they, they haven't made up their minds what they want to do. They may not carry on the family business. Well, I think, I think they probably will carry on in the family business, but they probably want to do things different to what I've done. Would it upset you if they didn't? No, not really. I mean, uh, I know both of them would like to ha be in business. And uh, one of my sons is very interested in, in, in the IT and communications and media business. The other son is, you know, interested in logistics, and he's more inclined towards the existing businesses. And hopefully they'll make a good fit. But what about politics? Are you ever tempted by it? Not really. I mean, I've always, I've always had political interests. Um, my friends, I mean, Nanaji was, in, was a political interest. Um, and he, the Prime he, he Minister was a and the son. friend too? And well, he was no, Prime Minister is not, I mean, okay, he, he was not the Prime Minister. What Nanaji. would it take to tempt you into politics? Quite frankly, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm really cut out for politics, you know. Um, what attracted me to politics was that I wanted to participate in, in, in the process of my country, you know. And I'm a citizen and I have a right to express myself and I have a right to get my views heard and hopefully try and create a better environment and a better place to live in this Yeah, country. you're not jumping at politics, but you're not closing the door firmly either. No, I don't, I mean, I can't see myself getting into, into elective politics, no. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the political, what's happening politically. I'm interested in what's happening in the country. Um, that's, a, that's why I was, in a sense, friendly with Ramnathji, you know, and Nanaji. Nasi Wade, let's leave it there. The future, of course, will tell exactly what happens. Good luck and thank you for this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.